Welcome to the Portland Pentecostals podcast. We're happy you've decided to join us as we build a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Enjoy the message. I have a new series of lessons, and Pastor Anthony taught for six weeks, and thank you for all of those lessons. They're good for us digging in to find out who we are, is causes us to do what we do. Well, that's part of what we're going to be talking about for the next four weeks, and this is four lessons, and we're going to be talking about dominion, and this is a foundational concept. In other words, if we don't get the right concept of dominion, our house isn't built properly, our spiritual house, or our life is not built correctly if we don't start on the right foundation. And uh, perhaps you have been through the countryside. My wife and I, when we were on vacation last week, uh, when we're on the motorcycle, we're mostly on two-lane roads, and so we're in these old country towns. And, and I passed a, a, a property out on the highway, and there was a, a nice house. And then there was a not very nice house that used to look like it maybe was abandoned in the 1950s. And on the same property, there was a house that was just leaning over and crumbling on the same property. And it was like, well, we're just not going to maintain anything. It will just move if it gets too bad. That's what was going through my mind. And sometimes that's what we do in our lives is we just... We just, instead of doing what's right and maintaining our life, we just move on and say, well, I'll just start over somewhere else. I'll start with new relationships or I'll start with a new job or a new career. We'll, we'll do something different to get out of the funk we're in at, because this is not working. But God wants us to build our house. The Bible says the foolish man built his house on the sand, but the wise man built his house upon the rock. And so that lets us know that we build the house. Now it does say, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And so we do know that God builds the house, but we cooperate with him or we partner with him to build our house or our life. In the book of Genesis, this is the first time that this word is used in chapter number one. Genesis 1 and 26, in the creation story, it reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So this is a God idea. This is a God thing, is to give you and I dominion. Now we're going to come back in just a little moment. And we're going to give a definition to that word dominion. And then we're going to put flesh on that to say, okay, so I know what dominion it is, but what does that look like? Perhaps when you've looked up the definition of a word uh, and you say pernicious, what does that mean? Well, that's uh, uh, evil. <laughs> you know, uh, that's not good. Well, what do you mean? not good, evil, and you need an example to wrap around that word, and then you really get what that word means. So we're going to talk about dominion over four areas over the next four weeks. The first area of dominion that we're going to address tonight in detail is self. The second is Satan. The third is sin. And the fourth is circumstances. If, if we can get dominion in those areas of our life, we will have success or we will, and, and I hate to use the word success, we will be victorious in our Christian walk. We will be where God wants us to be. And remember, we all are not on the same page. We're not all at the same level. And so when we talk about being where God wants us to be, that doesn't mean there's this equality in the church of God. And please don't misunderstand me, but God didn't create us all equal. If we all were equal, we'd be just stick figures and we'd look alike. Yeah. And, and it, yeah, and if we were all equal, we'd all be shouting at each other to be heard or all be super quiet and waiting for the next person to speak. And we don't have equal intellect. We don't have equal body size. We don't have equal strengths and weaknesses. It's just not the way it is. God didn't create us equal, but he created us in his image. So we're going to talk about 
what that affords us or what that offers us or what abilities that being made in the image of God gives to us. So David is writing in Psalm chapter number 8, and he, he asks a question, and he says, What is man that thou art, you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. So he says, uh, we're really insignificant. We're way down the ladder. So there's God, the angels, and mankind. Yeah. We're a little lower than the angels. And you can take that however you want it. That doesn't mean we have lesser value. If we had lesser value, then the, the master of the universe wouldn't have clothed himself in flesh and came to give himself a ransom for us. Amen. He didn't do that for the, the demons. No. Never even gave them a shot. And so there's something different, unique about you and I because we were created in his image. And so we are a reflection of him. The angels weren't created in his image. Now, they've often appeared throughout time according to Scripture, and they look like mankind when they appeared. Sometimes they look exactly the stature and size. Sometimes they look larger than life, but they appeared in the form of a man. But they can also appear as angels of light. The angels of darkness can, so they can transform themselves and they can appear in a visible physical form, but really they're a spiritual being. So they're different than you and I. But the beauty of it is, he says, what is man that you visited us? And, and what's so special about us that you gave us dominion over all these things? So we want to talk about dominion for just a moment. So I'm going to give you some definitions of dominion. Dominion is a noun. That's a person, place, or thing. So it's not an adjective. It's not something you do. It's something you have. So it's like a car or something like that. So it is the power or the right of governing and controlling sovereign authority. Now, if you look at that word sovereign, you'll see the word reign in there, which lends to kingship or lordship. Or, uh, so uh, the sovereign of uh, England is the king, used to be the queen. So the ultimate authority. In other words, whatever they said, that was what would go. That would be the way that things would turn out. So when God gave man dominion over the earth, he gave him supreme authority. He gave man control. Yeah. So if you and I can place ourselves in the spot that Adam and Eve were in that beautiful garden that God planted eastward in Eden, and he said, hey, you have dominion. In other words, you're in charge here. And he made them in charge of absolutely everything. What would you do if you were king of the earth? Yes, I've often said it's a good thing I'm not God, because you wouldn't like God if God was me. But God is very different than you and I, but we have his likeness. In other words, God has authority he has ultimate authority. We call him omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, knowing everything, and omnipresent, everywhere present. Well, we're not like him in that way, but he did give us a sphere of influence as mankind. And he says, look at the earth, look at the sea, look at the heavens, uh, look at all of this. It belongs to you. Take dominion over it. Take authority over it. In other words, you're going to manage this thing for me. So you and I have been given management skills. God doesn't give us something without giving us the ability to do that. He doesn't command us to repent if we can't repent. He doesn't command us to walk above sin if we can't. we got to find out what tools we need to have in order to walk above sin or live above sin. So he gives us the tools and he says, hey, live this way. And he doesn't just leave us in the dark. That's part of what preaching the word and teaching Tuesdays is very important because what we're trying to get is concepts and we're managing them or putting them in manageable bite-sized things that we can apply to our life so we can become more like Christ. 
And so we can be more effective in this world, reaching others and making disciples of others. Or as was said in the last series of lessons, uh, until we can become more like him. And we hate what he hates, and we love what he loves. And that's where God is so different than humanity. Sometimes we hate people because we hate what they do. But God didn't hate the people because of what they did. He hated their actions, but he loved the people. That's why he came and gave himself a sacrifice. Now, that's so foreign to my human thinking. It's just like cause and effect. Let me be the judge here for one day. And I'm going to make sure, maybe you've heard when somebody gets a sentence, say in a murder trial, and the family is asked how they feel about it, almost always they say, well, it doesn't really make it right. It doesn't bring them back. It doesn't give wholeness. It doesn't give conclusion. There's a little bit of resolution, but it's never enough. But God is able to make things more than enough, and he's able to restore you and I. He's able to take us from sinner to saint, from sin-filled to Holy Spirit-filled, from walking and living after the desires and the dictates of the carnal man, the mind, the flesh, the appetites, to living after his will and purpose. But it's a process that happens. And guess what? It's a lifetime process. You and I will always be learning about him and growing in Christ and growing in the knowledge of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So number one, it's sovereign authority. Number two, dominion is rule or control or domination. Now that's a word we understand, the dominator. You know, that means we're the most powerful force. That, that means that we can not just say we're in charge, but we really can be in charge and we can force that. So when man was left in the garden, he could force anything the way he wanted it to. It's interesting if you read the detailed description of, of uh, what was happening in the garden that Adam even got to name the animals. Yeah. All of them. I mean, he, he had a... Uh, somehow God birthed him with this very adequate uh, intellect and, uh, and this language ability. And uh, when he would call it what it was, it, that's what it was. Now, we understand that he didn't speak English. I don't know what language that he did speak, but God gave him this ability to speak. And whatever he said, oh, that's a giraffe. It's a giraffe. Because Adam named it a giraffe. Why? Because he has dominion or he has authority. So if you have authority, you can call something what it is, what you decide it is, and that's what it is. So it's domination. And the final one is a territory, usually of considerable size, in which a single rulership holds sway. So a single rulership. So when he dropped man into the Garden of Eden, he says, you are the only leadership. You're the only ruler. You have authority. So we don't know how long Adam and Eve lived in that blissful state of, of communing with God daily, of, of keeping and dressing the garden, and that's back to another principle. God never planned for us to sit around and do nothing. He gave man a task, and, uh, and if we're made in the image of God, then God has a task. He has a purpose. He has a, a reason for being, for existing. And God always does what God's supposed to do, but sometimes we don't do what we're supposed to do. But then there are other times when we struggle to find out what it is we should be doing. And so hopefully by the time we're done with these four uh, lessons, we will understand dominion and we will have dominion. Now I'm going to read that first verse, reread the first verse that we read in the Amplified Version. The Amplified Version, what it does is it uses adverbs and adjectives. In other words, uh, like noun, dominion, it will describe what that means. Uh, so we read it again in the Amplified Version. And God said, let us make mankind in our image in, after our likeness and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, the tame beast, and over all the earth and over everything that creeps upon the earth. So I had to underline that just for my own sake because he gave them complete authority even over that snake. And if, and if Satan or uh, Lucifer decided to use the snake, really Adam had power over that snake, yep. that creeping thing. Yep. 
Well, it didn't creep beforehand, but then even after he was cast down, then he had dominion. So once you have dominion, you have to either be overcome by somebody to lose that dominion or just acquiesce. That means just give up. So God has intended for you and I to have dominion, especially the spirit-filled Christian. We have dominion and authority, and it's dictated by his word, the scope of that authority, and where we derive that authority, and how we keep that authority. It's all dictated in the word of God. And so what I have found out, that if I'm not having authority in a certain area that God tells me to have authority in, it's my fault. Because God never wimps out. He never fails to show up. He never fails to be there when he said he would be there. So this is a battle of supremacy and submission. There are, it's the battle of the flesh against the spirit of me versus him and of a moment versus forever. So that's what we're wrestling against uh, is those things. So when we're talking about dominion, We've got to take dominion or authority over our flesh. How many of you realize that's the toughest thing to do? My flesh bothers me much more than the devil does. It's there every day. It's there when I'm sleeping and wake up in the middle of the night. The flesh is there. The flesh is there when I open my eyes in the morning and I, oh man, there it is. And, And sometimes we don't like our flesh. And I'm not just talking about the fleshly actions. Uh, I'm talking about just our, who we are. But we're there. And so what I want to do is hopefully that when we're done, especially with this lesson tonight, that we begin to understand not only what authority we have, but what responsibility do we have in order to prepare to execute that authority right. or that dominion. So if we're ready for it, you know... Uh, <clears throat> Oftentimes, at least when I was a kid, I had to go take driver's education before I, my parents would get me, let me get my license. Now, there's a couple of reasons. It's number one, you had to have at least a B average to get into driver's ed. And number two, if you take driver's ed, you got a discount on insurance. You know, and insurance back there was 50 bucks a month. Go figure that one out. I don't know how they did that. But, uh, and if you took driver's ed, you could get your license earlier. You could bypass and instead of having a permit, you could go right from driver's ed into having a license. And so at 14 and a half years old, I got my license. And I'm not saying that in the presence of a bunch of teenagers. Why are you covering your eyes? (laughs) That's unbelievable. I don't know why my kids would think that there would be a problem with me having a license at 14 and a half. Unless it's like father, like son. Then maybe we can understand some of that. But they weren't going to give me my license until I had some training. So I got some knowledge and some experience. And so knowledge and experience will allow you and I to have more and more dominion or greater and greater authority. The more dominion we take over our flesh the more dominion we will have in the spirit realm. So let's take that journey for a little while. So God insists that we should first take charge over our own specific world, and this begins with taking dominion over ourselves and our own appetites. Now, the best thing that we can do is, well, here we see a picture of of the apple, and a lot of people say it's an apple that they ate in the garden. We don't know what the fruit. It was the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and it still existed even after they got expelled, and there was an angel or a cherubim kept there, which is a fighting angel, to make sure they didn't eat of the tree of life anymore and live forever because God didn't want them to live forever in this sinful state. So they were there, and they had an option, and they had dominion, and they could say no to the serpent, and they could say yes to God, and they probably did in, for a long, 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 long time, and we don't know how long that is. But it happened for a season. But when finally the woman listened, ate, gave to the man, he ate, then they lost authority. Because they didn't exhibit self-control. 
They didn't control their own appetites. So having authority in the spirit realm starts with controlling our own fleshly appetites. And that's the hardest thing to do. It's like they say, uh, psychologists, that it takes at least 30 days to form a new good habit and unwind a bad habit. So it's like, oh, I, I'm going to quit eating sugar for uh, three days and I'm going to lose 15 pounds. No, you're just going to quit eating sugar for life. Nothing's going to taste good ever again. <laughs> uh, but we know that in the physical, if we have goals, we have to have realistic plans in order to reach those goals. And, and we're all right with that. So sometimes we never reach our goal, and, and we're all right with saying, well, guess what? I never reached that goal, but it just, the pain wasn't worth the gain, and I just wasn't willing to do that. So what we have got to decide, are we willing to die out to our flesh and to ourself in order to become what Christ wants us to become and in order to obtain not just dominion in the spirit realm in this life, but life everlasting. So saying no to the flesh is one thing and saying yes to the spirit is another one. And we read the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faith, our goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. So we just need to say no to the flesh and yes to the spirit. That's where it starts, basically. So every day that I get up, I have to say no to the flesh and yes to the spirit. Every time I see something, I have to process and I have to say, would this be damaging to my spirit? Or would this be beneficial to my spirit? Or would this be neutral? And when it's neutral, then God lets us use our preferences to decide if we want to be involved in that activity because some things are neutral. It's just life. It's choices that we make. Whether it's white bread or wheat bread, I don't think God really cares. Whether it's strawberry jam or honey, I don't think he cares. I don't think he cares what color car you drive. There's things that God just doesn't care about, but there are very important things that we can look at and say, is that going to damage my spirit or is that going to enhance my spirit? Now, here's what's happened is you and I sometimes lived without this knowledge and we damaged our spirit or allowed it to become damaged and we really didn't realize how much damage happened to our spirit. But the beautiful thing about being a born again of the water and the spirit and indulging in his word is we can find things that we can do with regularity, simple things. And by simple, I mean straightforward things, not undifficult, <laughs> if that's a good way of saying. Sometimes it's difficult, but it's straightforward. You just do it every day, or you do it every time you're faced with that circumstance or situation. You just do what's best for your spirit because you're protecting your spirit because that's the part of me that's going to live on forever. I'm not taking this body to heaven. <laughs> Remember Sister Dolores? No, I'm not going to tell on yet. You know, <laughs> says, uh, you know, there's things about each other that we don't uh, ourselves. We say, I, I wish I wasn't born this way. And we like to be different. And now, you know, Hollywood, some other people, you know, it's just like. You, you just don't want to be Kenny Rogers, you know. You want to be recognizable. You want to be different, but you want to be recognizable when the doctors are done with you, is that <laughs> is that we can fix our outside to look different, but we're still the same person on the inside. But if we allow God through his word to direct us and through his spirit, if we apply the principles of his word and let his spirit move upon us and through us, he will change us. The Bible says from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from strength to strength into his likeness. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And so in other words, we're always growing, we're always becoming, we're always evolving, if you please, or developing in our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why the sign that says, live, growing in Christ, living in community, because we're all growing in Christ. That's why when we have our discipleship class, which by the way, some of you want to be, may want to be involved in, starts the first uh, Tuesday night of September called Thrive. 
live, grow, thrive. And, it, and we're living in Jesus, but we got to keep growing in order to thrive. We choose whether we're going to sit down and quit developing or we're going to keep on moving in Christ Jesus. So Jesus knows when to challenge you and I. So we have been endowed by our maker with some God-given abilities. Number one, we've given the ability to create. So we can take raw material and we can create something out of it. We can't create like God that spoke into the nothingness and, and made something. But we have the ability to develop things. It's amazing what man has developed, isn't it? The chairs you're sitting on. The foam inside underneath that, that fabric that they have developed, in not medium density, but high density. And, and you feel in the back, the small of your back, there's an extra little piece there that gives you a little lumbar support. And, and uh, you think about things like that. The cars that we drive, it's incredible what we drive today compared to what they used to be. I remember first time I drove a truck, it was probably a 1954 uh, government issue Ford that was beat all to pieces. It was on my, grand, or my uncle's farm. You know, when the government couldn't get any more use out of it, a little bit of binder twine and some lubrication and a welder. Well, you can still use it on the farm because all you're doing is you're driving across the field going like this, pom, 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 pom. And they could be old bias ply tires that are slick as all get out, but you're just in a field, so who cares? And you just make it work. And it was really rugged and rough and raw, but now we dr drive refined things because we're able to create. Look at the way that man is able to somehow visualize a light bulb and, and the source of that and hydroelectricity. We want, walked over a dam. There's a dam on the Snoqualmie River, I think it is. It's a, a Snoqualmie Falls. And in 1899, they built a hydroelectric project. Well, that's a long time ago. Why? To put electricity into the homes. And that was before we had a lot of the, the who had heard of a blender? Who heard of an iPhone? Who heard of a lot of things? But man has the ability to create. And man has the ability to take charge or to take dominion. And we also have the ability to plan our future in detail. Or just roll over and play dead and just, what, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. So we have a choice. So tonight, I hope by the power of God's word and his spirit that we feel motivated to take control, to take dominion, to assert our authority back into our life. The enemy uh, is not, the, the, the enemy of our soul is not the one that has control over that. Right. Right. Amen. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from thee. Yes. That's a biblical principle that we have, and it's not in my scriptural context. It's in context tonight, but it's not on there. So we know there's simple things or very direct things that we do that have an impact. Yep. So what we have to do is find out what those direct things that we need to do that have an impact are and consistently, repetitively do those things. And what happens is as we continue to do those things, then we get further and further away from what we were and closer and closer to what we want to be and we gain more authority and more dominion over the flesh. And as we do that, we let the Spirit come into our life and naturally the Spirit invades uh, when we put the flesh down. Submit to God, resist the devil. You know, submit to God, he'll draw nigh unto you. So that means we submit our flesh. I'm going to read a, a statement that was written by an individual. It says, sow a, thought, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. So you see how it's break, broken down into small parts here? And it's a beautiful saying, it's not a scriptural thing, but it's a principle that works, is that it all starts with sowing a thought. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Yeah. So when you and I are born again of the water and the spirit, we need to remind ourselves and the enemy of our soul every day, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. I am not that old sinner that you saw yesterday. I'm not filled with, Sister Mary, you're a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. And you can wake up tomorrow morning, and if your thoughts go, oh, look what I did. No, no, I'm a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. I, I'm a new creation in Him. 
And we need to remind ourselves and we need to remind the enemy of our soul. And our enemy hates that. Because he can never be redeemed. There is no hope of redemption for him. And part of the reason we have redemption is because he blew it and he killed Jesus. And then tried to get glory and kill the one who came to give his life. He, He unleashed the forgiveness of heaven. He unleashed the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank God for the blood. And when we're baptized in his name, his blood is applied. We, how do you know that? Because when we come up, sin doesn't have any more dominion. Jesus said, it's finished. What's finished? I have authority, absolute authority. I can deliver the captives. I can preach to those that are in captivity. So we need to realize that it starts with sowing a thought, how we think. So it's what we dwell on, what we feed our mind with, uh, uh, what we share in communication with others. uh, And there are things that I can hear a little bit of, and then I've had enough. And even on current events, I can hear enough, and that's enough. And sometimes enough is too much. Because I can't control those current events. I can't control those other people. Even when I vote. You know, I used to say for people, vote with me. I vote for the loser every time. Just vote with me. Let me run your campaign if you want to lose. I'll help you. But, and, and we sometimes feel that that's beyond our control. And it really is beyond our control. And this just doesn't make sense to me some ways. But, you know, God puts kings up and he brings them down and even in Israel, he let them go under captivity so that they would come back, back to repentance. Maybe some of what's happening in America today is God's trying to bring us to repentance and realize that, hey, we're not in control anymore. This isn't about doing it our way. This isn't about our plan. It's about his plan. It's his will. It's his design. And so we need to back off and say, okay, God be in control. And this is a a truly American thing or a Western society thing or a a republic or democracy thing is even having a choice because most of the world doesn't live with a choice. They're dictators or they're monarchs. And in the day of Jesus Christ and in the day of the Old Testament, it was almost all kings until the Greek the Roman gov- Greek government came in and the Roman government, then there was a little bit of difference. But So they understood dominion or sovereignty. So let's look at that, and I hope you can take that to heart and realize I'm going to sow a thought, and that will help me reap an action, because it's a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And then the actions reap habits, and then the habits create character, because what we do makes us who we are. So it's back into that thing. We do who we are. But sometimes doing what we should do makes us who we are. So it's an inescapable tension there that we really do need to submit to God so that he will draw nigh to us. But we got to resist the devil too. We're not just saying, hey, you know, God, you chase the devil off. No, you resist him. (laughs) And a lot of times it's just resisting. It's just standing in the power that he has given. So there are several hindrances that happen in, in the life of an individual. Uncontrolled passions, too many, t- too, much, too many demands on our time. The workplace may be requiring too much of us. The emotional needs of the family. So what we need to do is we need to take dominion over those areas. And I know I'm not giving you a conclusive answer, but what I'm telling you is that these things that hinder you from being what you ha- should be, from taking dominion over the flesh, mitigate those problems. Maybe you need to tell the boss, I can't work that day. Or maybe you need to pray that God will give you a place where it doesn't take so much of your energy. Or maybe you need to rein in with your passions. And that's where it really starts is in our personal life. So control what you can control in your life and take dominion over those things. So the greatest enemy of change and dominion, and you and I taking dominion, is fear and guilt. Fear that we won't be able to do it or fear that we might be able to do it. Have you ever not done something because you were afraid that you'd be successful? Just just act like you don't know how to do it and the boss will never give you that responsibility. (laughs) Just be a buffoon. Yeah. Now, that's not a biblical thing. The Bible says that 
We should be diligent and honest. And as a Christian, you should have a job when nobody else has a job because, I mean, you're not going to come to work drunk and you're not going to steal from the boss and you're not going to cause interpersonal problems on the job. And those three things, you're a superhero now. Yeah. You give an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. So you should be all right. And those of you that supervise people understand that that's truer now than it seemed to ever have been. So we're fearing failure and we're fearing success. And sometimes we have guilt over our past. And so we just won't let ourselves be forgiven to allow us to be free to try to take dominion in the areas that we should take dominion in. So... We have, to have, we have to decide that we're going to change. So consider what God wants you to change, not what you want to change. So how does this happen? This happens with regularly reading his word and spending time in communion with him. And I, you notice I use the word communion because communion is me talking and him talking. And it's really hard sometimes, especially when you have a lot of needs, to shut up and listen because God might give you the answer. You're... And I've often said that when you pray for God to answer a prayer, be willing to be the answer to your prayer. You might be the answer to your prayer for that other person and for you. We are the answer to the prayer for our brothers and sisters in Christ often. If you, we see a brother in need, we're supposed to help them. So I would encourage you over the next three or four weeks to pray about what God wants you to change in your life. And Remember, thoughts reap an action, actions reap a habit, habit reaps a character, character a destiny. So you start with the way you're thinking. So I want to say, God, tell me how to think. Now, here's a flaw some of us have. We want the whole ball of wax at once, and we want to change overnight. God, give me the blueprints. Give me the whole set of blueprints. My family has this habit that we drive through neighborhoods where they're building new houses, and we just go let ourselves in if the door's unlocked. That's not breaking and entering, right? You do that? Really, you criminal. You, yeah. uh, oh, the backyard too, huh? Because there's curiosity. I want to say, oh, there's a new house in the neighborhood. Let's drive. Let's go see what it's like. Let's, oh, uh, yeah. They didn't lock the door. And, and oftentimes we'll go in when it's just studs, you know, and you really can't. You've got to really visualize it. And uh, sometimes they'll have the blueprints in there and they'll roll it out. And you say, oh, that's what's here. That's what's here. But then as the skin gets on it, then it's easier to tell. It's like, wow, that's a big room. And uh, in fact, there's a neighborhood that's, not very far from here, one day, they're all new houses, and, and there was a key in the door of one of them. It fit every house in the neighborhood. It didn't say so, but I found out so. I just took dominion. And I walked through all these new houses. They're beautiful houses. But the key was there. See, if we can find the key, we can go wherever we need to go. So, so God, by his spirit, will speak to you, and through his word will speak to you. And that's why if you're a brand new Christian or brand new to attending Portland Pentecostals, if you want to join Thrive Class, you can see me or Brother uh, Anthony or Brother Eli and say, hey, I want to be involved in that. We'll give you principles that you apply, that if you regularly apply those, you will hear the voice of God. And you will know what God wants for you. And you may not have the whole blueprint, but God has a blueprint, and he says, you need to do this now. And it's people that know how to read a blueprint. You can roll it out and you can say, okay, well, you build the foundation before you put the frame up. Yeah. And you got to have a frame before you can put the electrical and the plumbing in. And you better do that first before you put the drywall in or the toilet's not going to flush. It's the, you got to do things in the right order. So we have that expectation in the, in the normal carnal world, but we need to have that expectation in the spiritual realm. In our lives, in your life, and in my life. And so God knows the order. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So he has a direct order. 
And, and there are basic salvation steps, but each one of us, our lives were unraveled in a different fashion. And to get it back to where it needs to be, God knows exactly what you need to do first. And he will speak to you on what you need to do. So that's why we need to love one another and be patient with one another because, hey, we're all broken and we need fixing. And God needs to fix us, and we need to be patient with one another. And even when we think we've just arrived, six weeks later, we're going to say, really, God? How come you didn't tell me that before? And he's going to say, because you weren't ready. And so God takes us from strength to strength and from glory to glory. So consider what God would want you to change. Use God's original pattern. Remember, we're creators. Create opportunities for change in your life. Second thing, take charge. Be the head, not the tail. You say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is how it's going to go. I'm not going to let these things into my life, into my mind, into my house, into my family, into my world. So there's things that we, we seal the door and say, uh-uh, you're not coming in. There's things that we might need to clean our house and throw out because there's habits that we have been involved in that have made us spiritually lazy or have encouraged the enemy to say, hey, you can just hang around in my house right now because this, these are my habits. And then chart your future by planning your present. Now that may seem, sound crazy, but if you will plan each day to get up and say, okay, this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Almost every day I say, every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Thank you, God, for always being there. And I thank him for the things that he has placed at my disposal in my life. And you know what? He's always given me enough. And some people would think if they look under my house, he gave me too much. But those are tools, and they always have a purpose. <laughs> so it's fine. So plan your present. Just say, okay, today I'm going to give up, get up, and I'm going to say, Lord, I submit myself to you, and I resist the devil. And that pushes the devil away and say, you don't even have to say to the devil, I resist you. You just resist those thoughts that he comes in, you filter those actions or opportunities that are given to you to do things that would not glorify God in your body or your spirit, you just shut the door and you don't allow that to come in. And that's resisting the devil. And he, he'll go find somewhere else because he's lazy. So let's chart our future by planning our present. So break it all down, write it down step by step. You may need to write down exactly what you need to do. As you're thinking, I do it on the notes on my phone. Some of you journal and God talks to you and you write down thoughts that you have and go back and read a letter. You've got to figure out who you are and how it works for you. And, but make a plan. And your planning, my planning, should include laying aside old habits, creating new habits, and oftentimes that's as important as laying aside the old habits. You've got to find something new to do with your time, something new to do with your mind, something new to do with your passions, because that old fed something in you. It fed your flesh. But you can find satisfaction in your flesh in living for Jesus Christ, because he knows what we're made of. When he planted Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave them everything they need and everything that would satisfy them. He said it was very good. They just thought they knew better, and they were convinced by Satan that they knew better. And so we need to create new habits. Then forgiving others is another big part of being able to move on. That's a, that's a task, isn't it? So I'm not going to finish this lesson tonight, I know, so I'm going to end up with five or six, because why don't you go ahead and stand, because I have probably 13 scriptures still tonight. So I'm not going to wear you out. Forgiving yourself and forgiving God and then moving on. That's, I think, a good starting place for you and for me. Is we need to be able to forgive. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. So it, that makes it very, very personal. That's really tough, isn't it? Now, if you're struggling with forgiveness, I have a great video that I could give you that's online, a YouTube that I could give you that uh, it gives us a process of forgiveness. And I've watched it many times. Some people I've given this link to, they've watched it four or five times and said every time it did something to me. It helped me along in the process because usually the first time we do something, we're not flawless. Remember the first time you rode a bike? I don't know why I don't still have scratches on my arms. We had this wonderful fail-safe method, at least my siblings did, and I had to be under five years old because I know what house we were at, and we only had one bike to share amongst us. Well, there were four of us at that time. And I remember my siblings getting me on the bike, and my, I could, my tiptoes could reach the pedals. It was a little 20-inch Schwinn bike, and the seat was probably as low as it could be. Maybe not, because I had older siblings. They maybe had it a little higher and were just kind of pushing me. And then when it was my time to ride, they said, okay, pedal, and they'd shove me. <laughs> What's wrong with that, huh? <laughs> yeah, 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 it wasn't down a hill, because they knew at the end of the lawn... There was a whole, there was lilac bushes, and it was a hedge. And, and the bike would stay upright. You just had to lean back so you didn't get poked by a branch or anything. And you get scratched up a little bit. I don't know how many times my siblings shoved me down that. Well, well it, it was a sidewalk, but the sidewalk went like this because the sidewalk went around a crab apple tree. You know, not going to cut the crab apple tree down, and you want the sidewalk to reach the front door so it just had a jog there. So they'd start me at the front door, and you'd go, and for half the yard, you'd be on nice smooth pavement, and then bum, 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 down the front yard, and <laughs> And eventually, you learn how to do it. Sometimes living for God's that way. We try, but we do not execute flawlessly. We begin, and it's a little awkward and we tip over or we fall off and we get our bruises, but we got to get back up and start over again. So if you could tonight begin to ask God and tomorrow morning when you get up, say, okay, God, whether I'm going to have a plan of reading in an exact, like I'm going to read through the Bible. Or if you've never read through the Bible, don't start in Deuteronomy. Start in, start in the New Testament. Read the New Testament, and then go to the Old Testament eventually. Or you uh, can get a Bible reading program app online, like YouVersion or something like that, and it will feed you scriptures to read every day. The key is, is reading the Word of God so that you can hide it in your heart, so that you can apply the principles of that. So find a time to Get in touch with God's word because it's the supreme authority, right? God's word does not lie. It's forever settled in heaven. So if you find an answer for your life, it's not going to change. God's not going to rewrite it next month and say, oops, revision number three. Did I get the right revision, God? No, it's there. It's the principle. And spend some time talking with God and God talking to you. And how does God talk to you? You'll figure out God's voice. Some of us, me, uh, I know it, it's, a, it's a nudge. It, it's a thought that comes into my mind. Some of you, you may hear a voice. Some of you, God may lead you in your word, in your reading of the word, and you know what his voice is. But spend time with him to become intimate with him. Because remember, the dominion came from him. So if we want to take dominion back, we've got to be connected to him and submitted to him. So this is the beauty. We can, uh, we can just grasp for power and authority and spiritual dominion and might. But if we're not submitting to him, we'll never get there. But if we begin submitting to him and surrender to him on a regular basis, eventually we get dominion. We get to where we want to be we obtain what we are scrambling for. So dominion over self is very important. So we'll decide if we're going to break this up a little bit different next week. But let's open our heart to God. Would you tonight, dear Jesus, we open our spirit to you. I, I want to be like you. I, 
I, I need your help to do that. I pray for each one of us in this room that you would speak to us through your word, that it would become that living word that would speak to our instances, that would speak to our issues in life. And Lord, we're going to drop all barrier and resistance to your word speaking to us. And we open our hearts to your spirit. I pray that as we read your word and seek your face, that your, your will and your plan would be clear. Give us courage to, to write a new plan of what we're going to get out of our life, what habits we're going to break and what new habits we're going to start. Help us with our thoughts so that...